We appreciate you blending your voices with ours and your hearts and your minds with ours as we have prayed together to the Almighty God, the Sovereign of all creation. Thank you for blending your voices and your hearts and your minds together with us as we have sung these songs of praises and we have prepared ourselves to remember our Lord's death. We have prepared ourselves for a lesson that will emphasize the greatness and the holiness of God and our absolute dependence upon Him. If you have any questions or any comments about anything, please let me know after the service. I'll be right back there. We'd love to discuss it with you if you need to. If you want to study something further, if you want clarification on something, I tend to talk a little fast sometimes. If I've confused you, let me know. I would be happy to clear that up for you. I would like for you to open your Bibles with me this morning and let's study this together. As we've just participated in the song that Eddie was nice enough to lead for us, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. I will tell you that that name, Jehovah, is a name above all names. It is the name that God had declared unto himself in the Old Testament. It is a name that means self-existing. And to be totally honest with you, it is a name that I feel I am not even worthy to utter. This lesson is going to emphasize... God again and our dependence upon him and it's also going to make sure uh, that we know in some clarification on how he guides us because again if we would take a phrase uh, out of its context we can assume its meaning but I don't want to do that I want us to emphasize also how it is that God guides us. So let's, as we prepare to break this open and to get into it, please allow your mind to, to fathom for just a moment a glimpse of the glory of God and to fathom the greatness and the power of He whom we serve. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each one having six wings. And with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one called unto another and said, Holy, 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 Jehovah of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook of the voice of him which cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said me, Woe, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, Jehovah of hosts. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah got a glimpse of deity in his majesty. And it's interesting that that would adequately prepare Isaiah for the task at hand to preach to a rebellious and unrepentant nation. And I believe that it's something that we should keep ever present in our mind, just who it is we serve, and His majesty, and His glory, and His holiness. Now let me reiterate that for just a moment. These seraphim, who are greater than you and I, in His presence, cover face and feet in absolute reverence, not even gazing upon the magnificence of God. And they would fly with two wings while giving obeisance with, with four. And that ought to emphasize our attitude toward Almighty God when we would pray to Him. God is not your buddy. He's not your peer. He's not your pal. He is absolute king. And he is worthy of our reverence. And when we think of him and we contemplate him and we would bow our, our, our minds and our heads in, in prayer to him, we ought to tremble with that comprehension. God would release his children from the bondage of Egypt. He spoke of in Exodus 3, reference Acts chapter 7. He heard their groaning and would come and deliver this people from this nation. And as he would send these ten plagues upon Pharaoh to, to harden Pharaoh's heart. And as the final plague in Exodus 12, the firstborn uh, uh, dying of man, woman, and beast. 
And as he would uh, uh, curse them with this last plague, and Pharaoh says, fine, get out of here. And Pharaoh would change his mind because he still asked that question way back in Exodus chapter 5, at the very beginning of the chapter, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Well, Pharaoh was answered, but he wasn't answered immediately. So after the ten plagues, then after Moses, uh, by the will of God, moved this massive army uh, or this massive uh, 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 nation of humanity out of Egyptian bondage, and as they camp there on one side of the Red Sea and God guides them with a pillar of fire at night. Can you imagine the magnificence? Can you see it with your mind's eye? Could you imagine a pillar of cloud by day between he and the armies of Egypt to protect them? And as they would go through the Red Sea... And as the Egyptians tried to do so, they were slain by God by the waters coming down upon them. And as these corpses would wash up to their feet, the children of Israel in Exodus 15 would sing a song that you and I know, the Song of Moses. And in this song they would say, Who is like unto thee, O Lord? That's the God that we worship today. Magnificent. All powerful, holy, kind, compassionate, loving, but just. So, as we contemplate this, to introduce the lesson, a recognition of our absolute reliance upon God is necessary for every human being. You know, have you ever been dependent on anybody? The answer is yes, right? When, when you were a baby, you were completely dependent on mama, weren't you? Imagine that emphasized even more of our dependence on God, spiritually speaking. Could you get to heaven on your own? The chasm is so wide, isn't it? It's not even, to even contemplate it is absurd. The psalmist would say, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment. Then the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimony. Psalm 25, 8 through 10. For the lamb which is in the midst of them shall feed them and shall lead them unto living waters. And God shall wipe all the tears away from their eyes. Revelation 7, 17. This lesson will look at God, our deliverer, teacher, and guide. And emphasize our need to trust in Him. Almighty God is the strong deliverer. Paul writing to those Colossians would write. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. And hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. The American Standard says. The kingdom of the Son of His love. Verse 14 says. In whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of our sins. Paul shows you that there are two possibilities. We were talking about that very thing this morning. You are either in the power of darkness or the kingdom of Jesus. There is no in-between. And there's only one way to get in the kingdom of Jesus. And God is that deliverer. God is the means by which this is accomplished. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he hath raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. He is a strong deliverer. Romans 11 and verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer. And shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Strong deliverer. Be thou still my strength and shield. Consider how God is the strong deliverer. We're going to go to the Old Testament. You ready? To understand how God is the strong deliverer of Noah. Genesis chapter 8. And it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And the second month, on the 7th and 20th day of the month, was the earth dried, and God spake unto Mo, uh, Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons, and thy son's wife with thee. Eric, why did you put that specific scripture in here? Why didn't you go back and, and tell about the flood? Because this is God accomplishing his promise. Genesis 6, wickedness was rampant throughout the world, remember? 
And the thought of man was nothing but evil continually. God tells Noah, I will destroy this earth. Build you an ark of gopher wood. Uh, Noah got to work, didn't he? And in chapter 7, as all the animals were called to the ark and as Noah and his family go inside and God shuts the door and this deluge comes, the flood was not only a, a 40 day rain, it says the great fountains of the deep were broken up. This is a word that implies violence. There was terrible quaking of the ark and this water that was underneath would come forth and it would have been a tremendous and terrible tsunami. So much so that Jesus uh, emphasizes that in Matthew 24, speaking of the suddenness of his coming, and said they were all eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, and the flood came and swept them away. This would have been a terrible cataclysm. I don't know about you, but I'd have been a little concerned. Even had I been Noah in that ark, and I would have felt the, the ark being lifted up by these waters and being tossed and turned by the waves, I would have been terribly concerned. Wouldn't you? But God says, I will make my covenant with thee and I will bring you out of this ark. And he did. The things written aforetime, written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15, 4. God is the strong deliverer of David. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you will, please. We're going to look uh, at a few verses. If you remember 1 Samuel 17, here we have the great confront uh, confrontation, right? David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Saul didn't care. Go on, David. Let him kill you. Who is, who is at the opposite end of this spectrum? The champion of the Philistines, the behemoth himself, Goliath. And Goliath would come forth, and you've seen some of the movies perhaps, and sometimes there were, there were armies set to go uh, to battle, and two champions would come out, and the champions would decide the fate of the entire war, and the champion of Gath would come out, this Philistine, he would come out, and he's an absolute monster. Not only is he a big man, he is a bred and born Warrior, And all he's ever done is kill and conquer. And he would defy the children of Israel for 40 days and he would call out, taunting them constantly. And David hears it and he's like, who does this guy think he is? And David is this young man. And he's, he's a, a, a no warrior and he's, he's no battle seasoned, battle hardened general at this point. And the text would say that David had absolute confidence. David said, I'll go out. And they're like, no, 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 no. His brothers told him no. And then Saul, the king, says, go on out. That's fine. But notice what David says. David says, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. That is when he was a shepherd. And he'll deliver me again. We just sang about a strong deliverer. 1 Samuel 17, 45. Then said David to the Philistine, thou comest at me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defined. Can you imagine the confidence of this man in Almighty God? There is absolutely no doubt in David's mind. Now, as far as I know, there has been no revelation from God to David saying, Hey, David, don't worry about anything. I got you covered. David simply trusted in God. He says, I know for a fact that this man is the enemy of God. And if I oppose the enemy of God uh, and I'm doing what's right, I know God will be with me. This day will the Lord deliver me uh, into uh, deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when a Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David ran towards him. Any of you ever been in a physical confrontation? It's not exactly fun, is it? Imagine being in these days when the physical confrontation uh, in, enjoined a sword, a spear, or a, a, uh, a helmet, a buckler, greaves, and a, and a shield. Imagine if one slip up means you're dead. And David ran right to it. 
He was anxious to do so. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And the Philistines saw their champion dead. They fled. You could do series of sermons on this account. If nothing else, the principle of with God is with you who can oppose you. Let's keep going. God is the strong deliverer of Hezekiah. 2 Kings chapter 19. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the king of Assyria. Do you remember old Sennacherib when he was coming to, to besiege the walls of Judah? And as he was coming, he sent his, his spokesman, Rabshakeh, to come. And in the ears of the, of the Hebrews, he would say it in the Hebrews' language to scare these people to death. You are not going to be delivered out of our hands. There has not been one God that has opposed us. We've conquered all, and your God's not going to conquer us either. We're going to conquer you. And it scared him to death. But Hezekiah, with humility, prayed. And Isaiah would tell him the result of what Hezekiah's prayer accomplished. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow here, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine sake, and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote at the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. A score was twenty. One hundred and eighty-five thousand died that night. Simply by God willing it to be so. Hezekiah in his prayer would articulate his absolute reliance upon God in this matter. And God answered. God is the strong deliverer. Daniel chapter 3. Anybody remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I think this is one of the most wonderful accounts in Scripture. This is an account that every young child should read from the time that they are uh, very young to the time that they're teenagers to understand that it's okay to oppose the world as long as you're doing right. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, what did the king say? The king, uh, on behest of his, uh, his minions, would say that every man that doesn't bow down when they hear the, uh, the, the, the psaltery or the harp, when an instrument was played, they were to bow down to worship the idol that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Well, that's a problem uh, for the faithful, isn't it? And these, kings oppo or these, these young lads opposed him. And these, these lads, they're teenagers. They're not old men. They're not seasoned veterans. And therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace was exceeding hot, so Nebuchadnezzar says, you're going to bow down and you're going to worship this idol or I'm going to cast you into this furnace. And, they, and, and they're not even concerned. So Nebuchadnezzar is so angry that he makes sure that the furnace is exceedingly hot, so hot that the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. And he rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Then answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. Walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the, fourth, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth. And they came thither. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. Do you know what they said to the king before they tossed him in the fire? Be it known unto thee, O king, that regardless of whether God will save us or not, we won't bow. What's your point, Eric? God is the strong deliverer. Does that mean that if you or I are bound and we're cast into a fire, God's going to spare us? No, it does not. But it does mean that we can find comfort knowing that God is concerned with His faithful and that He is the deliverer of them one way or the other. 
Strong deliverer in light of three chapters later, Daniel chapter 6, same concept with Daniel. They tried to set him up so that he would be opposed by King Nebuchadnezzar because of his, uh, uh, his he was such a likable guy. And, and with God's providence, he was rising in the ranks, if you will, especially in the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. And the same, basically the same obligation was set forth. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. How would you like that? You ever seen them? You ever seen a lion? I've seen a, a lion or two. We, uh, we've, we've taken several vacations to various zoos and we've seen lions and tigers. And guess what you don't want to quarrel with one of them? They will eat you forthwith. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. They're simply bigger, stronger, faster. That's what they were made to do. So Daniel was cast into a den of lions. Would that give anybody a little trepidation? Oh man, what is going on? Now the king spake unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And the stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be uh, changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night in fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and sleep went from him. He was a little worried for Daniel, wasn't he? Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice, that sadness... And the king spake and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. He was answered, wasn't he? Abel? God who made the lion, God who made the tiger. You know, there's some interesting chapters. Some of my favorite chapters in Scripture are in Job 38 through 41. And in Job 38 through 41, God answers Job. Out of this tempest, out of this storm, out of this whirlwind. And he asks him these questions that are so terribly humbling. Anytime you think you're smart, just read Job 38. And he would ask him about two creatures in Job 40 and Job 41, Behemoth and Leviathan. And in Job 41, the point is Leviathan was so magnificent that there's not a man that has ever tamed him. Your spears bounce off him. His nose breathes smoke. You are nothing but a worm to him and no man can tame him. Yet I created him and I have absolute power over him. How much less can you answer me? That's the point. And when we think about this in light of the king's question, was he able to deliver thee? Oh, absolutely. And he did. God had absolute control over this situation. And Daniel was kept safe in the midst of absolute certain death. Exodus chapter 13, beginning in verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. You know what a pillar is? It's not what you lay your head on. That's what we used to call it sometime because... My grandpa said pillar instead of pillow. Like Geneva is Geneva, according to him. I thought that was kind of funny. But a pillar isn't what you lay your head on, even though as a child I kind of visualized it that way. A pillar is a column, right? Well, God led the nation of Israel as they were escaping Egyptian bondage. By day you saw this massive column of a cloud leading. And by night it was what? And a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. What a magnificent sight that must have been. As he would guide the nation of Israel in a pillar of cloud and fire, he pilots us one specific way. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which hath built his house upon the rock and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. Whoso rejecteth me and receiveth not my word has one that judges him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. God guides us through his inspired word. His word guides us in the way of salvation, confident that we will be provided with a home in heaven as we leave this earth. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in old, dry, crusty pastures. Oh no, green pastures. Pastures that provide what you need. He leadeth me beside the, the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. How does he do so? Who wrote this song? 
By inspiration, David. Do you know that David also wrote Psalm 119, the longest chapter in Scripture? You know what the, the entirety of the chapter is devoted to? God's Word. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Can you really say that? Do you say that? Do you ever think about that? We sing a few songs. Some of those songs, the, the, the final verse of those songs really gets you thinking about it. And when my life is over or whenever we're approaching the end or when I take my last breath or will I walk the veil with him or meet him in the air, those concepts, do we ever think about that outside of these assemblies? I do. And do you know what I want? I want such a strength from God's word and I want such an assurance from God's word that as I approach death, I'm longing I'm longing for it. And as I approach the valley of the shadow of death, I can confidently say, man, I'm not worried in the least little bit. I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Just as the shepherd, thy rod and thy staff comfort me, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen, David. His word guides us in the way of salvation. That gives us absolute assurance of what we have to look forward to. Mm -hmm. David would write asking, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. My, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Same chapter a few verses later. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. David would say thy word is a lamp unto my feet and light. What did God do at night for the, or for the nation of Israel? He led them with a pillar of fire. And he says my word is a lamp. Follow it. I wonder when God led those captives, how many of them got a little torch and went their own way? Oh, well, I see that big pillar going that way. I'm going over here. I've got my little dinky little uh, one torch, and I've I'm, I'm really got some light here where you see this massive column of light. Which one are you going to follow? Why don't you just do it God's way? He's the pillar of the fire that is leading the way from earth to eternity with him. It's his way. Just follow him. Don't light your little torch and go your own little way. It doesn't work that way. Deuteronomy 4, Proverbs 30, Revelation 22. Do not add to my word. Do not take away from my word. Don't do it. Just do what I tell you to do. If you love me, you're going to do what I tell you. If you trust me, you're going to believe me. You're going to do it my way. Right? That's all we want to do. So many misunderstandings as it relates to this very concept. How does God guide us? Well, we know how God guides us. Do you know how God offers grace? Acts 14 and verse 3. The word of his grace. Acts 20 and verse 32. The word of his grace. Acts 20 and verse 24. The gospel of of grace. Grace is offered to man by instruction from God. The gospel instructs man to do what is necessary in order to be saved. That's how God offers grace. Mm -hmm. Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Period. No, there's more. Is it there? For the grace of God uh, that bringeth salvation has appeared unto everybody, guys. Hey, everybody's saved. We don't have to do anything. No, 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 no. Keep reading. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Listen. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, godly, and righteously in this present world. You mean God's grace is instructive? Absolutely. And what happens if we don't heed the instruction? You miss it. Don't you? Romans 1, 16 and 17 teaches that God saves man one way and only one way. The gospel is God's way unto salvation for man. One cannot be guided by God outside of God's inspired word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction. Right? 
that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished in all good works. If God's word gives me all that I need, why do I need help somewhere else? Oh, I don't. If God's inspired word is sufficient, why do I need the Holy Spirit to help me interpret it? When Jesus expects me to interpret it properly anyway. Luke 10, 26. Folks, don't buy into that fallacy. If you're influenced by God, you're influenced by God by His Word. By teaching or by reading it, by considering it, by applying it. Please understand that. 2 Peter 1, beginning in verse 3. How in the world can we grow? How in the world can we make ourselves such that we never fall? Peter will tell you, right? Add unto your grace virtue and virtue knowledge and knowledge temperance. All these wonderful attributes that God teaches in His Word. Well, whose job is it to do it? I thought the Holy Spirit just zapped me clean and, and changed me. No, no, no. That's your job. He's given you the material that will change your life. All you have to do is read it and apply it. Please understand that. We've got the obligation. One cannot be in a relationship with God outside of obedience to his will. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Verse 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Question. Based on, those are, those are red, word, red words, by the way. John, uh, John 10, that's, or John 15. That's the parable of the vine and sword, right? Red words. According to verse 10 and 7, if I do not abide in Jesus' teachings... Does he abide in me? Consider also the nature in which Jesus abides in them. John 7, uh, 15, 7, one more time, I'm going to read it for you. If you abide me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We abide in him when his word abides in us. Not literally, but by influence, right? The influence of his scriptures. His word teaches that God is faithful which gives us great comfort. Wasn't that comforting to go through those Old Testament passages and to see that God delivered them and he will also deliver us if we're simply just trusting and faithful to him. That's all. That's why when we sing that song, When I Tread the Verge of Jordan. Do you understand the significance of that? Do you remember what happened when Moses in Numbers 20, because of his rebellion against God and one, what we would deem as one small little mistake, God said, you'll never set foot on that land. So Joshua led them in the promised land. And in Joshua 2, if you remember, uh, as they were coming, and what did they do? They crossed the Jordan. And then where'd they go? Promised land. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fear subside. Lord, when I leave this earth, please let me be with you. And thou hast given them power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. John 17, 2. That the sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Christ Jesus. For the wages of sin and death is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. Romans 6, 23. Folks, when we tread the verge of Jordan, God can bid our anxious fears subside. You know how? You know why? You know how? Because through his instruction, I am confident in my eternal faith. God will deliver me as long as I'm faithful to him. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here this morning that have never obeyed the gospel? Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus, the Bible says that you must hear the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17, Faith cometh by hearing God's word, not by my opinions or my, my uh, thoughts or my, my dreams or visions or whatever you think you have. Faith is based on God said. We must repent of our sins. Acts 17, 30. We must believe in Jesus Christ. John 8, 24. We can believe in Jesus through his inspired word. John 20, verse 31. And we must confess Christ before men. Romans 10, 10. And we must be baptized for the remission of sins. Colossians 2, 10 through 13. And we must walk in harmony with his will. Romans 8, 1. For those who have obeyed the gospel, if you're not faithful, won't you change? Repent. Acknowledge your sin and prayer to God. He'll forgive you. If you need our prayers, we'll pray for you. We're going to sing an invitation song as we do if any have need. The invitation is yours. We beseech you, therefore, on behalf of Christ, be you reconciled to God right now as we stand and sing.